welcome to this FinTech panel. Um, I have the honor of speaking to these five fine gentlemen, uh, all professionals in the area. Um, but um, let me first start by introducing myself just one more time. So my name is Elisa Eisbeter, and I'm the Managing Director of Fintelum. At Fintelum, we do uh, blockchain-based instruments for the capital markets. Basically helping small and medium companies raise capital by crowdfunding and engage in secondary markets by tokenization. Now, compliance being uh, quite a big part of what we do at Fintelum, I'm extremely excited to talk to you guys today. <laughs> So let me first uh, run around the introduction perhaps one more time and then we can engage hopefully in a very lively discussion. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, I'm very pleased to be here and, uh, to discuss uh, those issues. And I'm Janis Brazowskis. I am from Finance Latvia, a board member of Finance Latvia. So, and also, I am a certified anti money laundering specialist. So, uh, Definitely compliance uh, takes a really good part of my everyday work and also uh, probably a cooperation with my peers in other countries, also primarily in the field of IML, CFT and TFC and also on anti-financial crime, crime compliance overall. Yeah, so uh, I'm Martin, I'm from Mintos. Mintos is a marketplace for investments and loans. Uh, today, the investors have funded around 3.5, 3.8, actually, billion euros of loans to our marketplace. In total, we have about 200,000 investors from all over the globe, and uh, perhaps we are the largest in our space in, in Europe. Yeah, my name is Anders Bezic, uh, managing partner of Change Ventures. We're the first uh, pan Baltic uh, seed stage venture capital fund. Uh, just yesterday, closed uh, 21 million euros, first close of that second fund. So we back startups uh, uh, from the Baltic states, so we've invested in 10 so far, and uh, another fund to invest more. Hello, my name is Reyes, and I'm CEO of Holland, and we are basically like a development bank, but we are not called bank, but uh, a financial institution. What we do, we, uh, we provide with uh, loans, guarantees, also venture capital, where there is a lot of finances, our Active portfolio is around 600 million euros, which we are very proud of because when we were um, putting together those three companies and merged, there was a merger in 2015. We started with 350 million euros, currently it's already 600 million euros, so we are growing. At the same time, the number of employees uh, is it, uh, decreasing. Uh, regarding the topic you raised, also about uh, AML, of course, there is uh, Similar like uh, other banks, we have uh, zero tolerance against those issues and sometimes, unfortunately, we also have some cases when after the spring of 2018, some clients tried to, to find other places where to get some finances, uh, all will not be the institution which will provide uh, with a lower threshold against those requirements, obviously. Hello, my name is Norbons. Uh, I'm uh, from Sierra Capital. Uh, we are a growth fund. Uh, so actually we did uh, two investments in the past uh, uh, in fintech uh, companies so, so basically perhaps that's why I'm here um, at least I'm here for the book uh, I, I like the book and I hope I like <laughs> but uh, basically uh, our strategy, current strategy is not focused on uh, fintech at all uh, so not yet not yet yet we, we, we have to be convinced but uh, actually what, what can I say is uh, our two uh, companies and uh, the first one we exited and uh, with a profit, luckily. And uh, so from such point of view it's good. And, uh, and uh, another one is uh, Mobili, we, we have in our portfolio currently and we hope to exit it with profit too. Okay. It's profit Well, uh, could you just give it a round of applause to our amazing We have two venture capital funds and we have one for profit governmental company, Alstra's company, and one non profit organization. So that's the color of, of our panel this morning. 
But the backdrop of the subject that we're going to be dealing with is um, something that actually goes back to the 70s, when the first um, um, treaties were formed. And, uh, it's a, such a long um, term, but basically the weapons of mass destruction, the, the, the weapon proliferation, the anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorist financing movement as such actually started back in the 70s. This is just to tell you how we came to the situation that brought us these shaky Baltic region uh, events which we're going to touch upon. Uh, effectively, I'll be honest with you, um, and it's no secret that the United States have been largely dictated in setting the tone on the international measures, how these uh, prevention measures should be taken. And if we look at some statistics on what has happened in politics, especially in Latvia, since the independence, I believe there's been 68 banks in Latvia alone, so that's a huge number. Today we have five banks which are in liquidation, we have 13 banks which are active, and out of those 13, at least 8 have been fined for not taking inadequate measures, and at least one bank has been given a warning. So this is the, the backdrop of our, for our discussion. In Lithuania, there's also some fines being issued. Most recently, uh, an enemy institution has been prevented from dealing with um, high-risk clients, which is pretty much every client, I'm just supposing. In um, Estonia, we have recent um, Danske Bank um, situation. So effectively, we're going to start with the bad and hopefully move on to something better. So given all this um, Baltic situation, would you, would you gentlemen believe that it's somehow impacted us um, reputation-wise? And have you actually experienced in your day-to-day -day business um, any consequences of this? Andrew, you're smiling at me, I think you have an answer. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, Sort of two parts of that analysis. So one part related to what we do. We invest in very early stage startups, uh, also in the fintech space. Um, so we definitely have seen an impact from uh, anti-money laundering uh, regulation tightening, uh, especially on very small companies trying to do very small, even you know, a few ten thousands of euros investment uh, checks, uh, facing huge struggles in getting getting bank accounts, getting transactions through, uh, the kind of transactions which frankly will not move the needle anywhere on any kind of anti-money laundering uh, situation. So I think that's that's one of the struggles that we definitely see some young, some young companies uh, that we're involved with. Uh, I think more broadly, outside of the startup space, there's definitely an impact on, uh, on the economy in terms of companies having a hard time opening bank accounts, managing transactions, and so uh, there is obviously a, um, a balance that the government needs to strike in terms of uh, how harshly they enforce the regulations to try and keep people <coughs> happy versus actually letting uh, transactions happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, I think, a struggle that is very real mm -hmm. right now. I, but I think the other comment I would make is we see huge opportunity. So I think there are amazing talents across all three Baltic states, people who have the ingenuity to build amazing products in the financial services space and the opportunities are largely actually outside of these markets, these are very small markets, so the opportunities, the big ones, you know, like Nordic and Latvia that we backed, uh, there are big markets in Spain and Scandinavia and the UK and other markets, right, Australia, so that's, there's massive opportunities to the teams based here to serve other bigger markets. That's really quite, quite positive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But like, if we stay on, on the note of, of reputation and difficulties and whether a financial regulator or the government needs to somehow uh, have their say in, in, in the matter. Jans, perhaps you can comment whether financial regulators, you also have experience in being uh, with the financial regulator in Latvia, do you believe that there's, um, there's any leeway at all or is it more um, a, a common acceptance because the majority of countries have accepted um, to, to basically work together in, 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 in diminishing the risks of AMF, terrorism financing, etc. 
and there are certain guidelines which are which are given by uh, institutions like the Financial Action Task Force and uh, evaluations by MoneyVal. Do you actually believe that there is any leeway for a regulator to somehow favour, for instance, startup scene, um, or we simply need to go by the book? Yeah, yeah, no I guess uh, first of all uh, that. Uh, IML, CFD, and uh, target differential sanctions are here for, for, for stay. So we just uh, have to leave with that and uh, adapt to that. And talking about the regulator, I think that uh, it's also came out from an FAT at the last meeting in uh, Paris two weeks ago that uh, all the system probably needs some sort of uh, adjustment because. Uh, uh, we do have this uh, mantra of uh, risk-based approach to the compliance issues and uh, probably we altogether have probably moved very far from that and probably that approach uh, we lost. So the, 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 what you are asking about the leeway, I think that it's very important just to beat uh, everyone in that uh, system, uh, regulators, uh, financial institutions, our customers, we are just uh, back to that uh, very core principle of uh, risk-based approach. So, and probably that's that's a tricky one because probably in the last years or probably the decade, we live with a uh, rule-based approach. So it's uh, also a question of uh, setting for a new mindset. So financial institutions are prepared for that. Uh, we are doing that. And I think that uh, we do have very good signs also from the regulatory Locally and locally, that uh, they are sort of here just to, to, to introduce that old mantra but to reinforce that. And since you, um, I'm going to speak to you for, for just one question. Um, okay. um, now, since you're in an um, organization which encompasses pretty much the Latvian financial uh, system, what do you see as um, efforts in collaborating uh, between these institutions? Uh, just in play, not, not about just a, I, I guess, oh, you can, financial you can part, I think. Uh, 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 yeah, for, for, first of all, I, I think that uh, in Europe and also in Latvia, and in this region, I don't think that it's uh, uh, right to say that uh, income and financial institutions are against fintechs <laughs> or stuff like that. Uh, we are just uh, cooperating with them and cooperating very much. Since uh, definitely, primarily, uh, we are here just to service our customers and provide them with uh, good quality uh, services. And in our days, when uh, digitalization and digital transformation are things of the essence, we also can do that without our guys for doing a feedback. Probably all over the world, you can see a very good uh, examples of cooperation in Latvia as well. No uh, exclusion on that. We also are cooperating. We have groups in Europe that uh, have our policy of open banking, and we speak to that. And uh, we really see a lot of opportunities to collaborate, and also in the field of compliance, because uh, there is a room for uh, the companies to come in with uh, in a right tech, in a right tech, and also in a tech. Fantastic. That's what we are talking about. We are talking about the regulators. I think that. Uh, it's time also to regulate those probably switch more also to the technologies and where is everything for us that the regulators are looking for solutions because uh, fight against the financial crime probably in the future is not going to be successful without the technologies and other partnerships as well. Absolutely. Could we do more? Yes, please. Uh, yes, <coughs> well, like you said that to be honest, also said that uh, this policy is now here for stay because uh, if uh, someone had a dog uh, previous years, I guess, then from the uh, 2018 February March, I guess, this topic is closed actually, right? But what I see during the uh, last uh, one and a half year, there is still like a bit of uh, not understanding of what's been said, what we should do, right? And in our also experience, there is still some, some part of clients who just come and just try to say, okay, it's a great project, can you support it? We said no, we just say why. So, uh, anyway, it's like and this. What, what are the typical reasons why would you? I'm just not talking about AML, uh, as you raised in your question, and I'm not uh, talking about those projects that we can, I don't know, uh, discussions about collateral, or track record, or something like that from the business perspective. I'm just, uh, as you uh, started this 
debate and what we say that it's this is particular field we can talk about collateral, track record, any other thing, but not about AML. This is like pinner system. Zero or one. You can pay the goal or you can speak to your policy, which is very important as well. Why it's important also for Alton? Because also in previous session there was also a presentation about their holding bonds uh, issues. And we also are very active in bonds, uh, right? So we have uh, issued three times bonds, and when we do our uh, road trips, there is not an option just to start to talk with our future investors about what's our cases and on what particular field. It doesn't matter whether this investment would be 20 or 50,000 euros, just a very small or 100, if there would be a no issue that currently definitely will go uh, a question from investors to us. I guess it will be very uh, soon that we will see that we will not receive a coupon like 0.95, which we had on this May, which is very big success for us. Also, Moody's rating, BA1, which we have, which is the uh, best in Latvia, it will be, I don't know, in two or three months, it will, uh, in my opinion, it will be done. So that's simple as it is, just uh, we have to stick to the policy which government says, not only just like a statement that we really need to implement it in our daily life. Like it or not. That's very powerful, I guess, then uh, the book still stands uh, written for us and the risk-based approach is, uh, is, is the way forward. Probably now, the only one way forward, eh? Mm. Now, um, Martin, would you say that it's been easy for startups to <coughs> enter into the market, which was pretty much saturated by the banking um, players? Not that uh, long ago. So, it's of course, it depends on the, perhaps in a broader sense, if you look banking and if you're going to compete with banks directly in one day, you so that. I think it's uh, hasn't been quite super easy to ask, and I'm not talking about the platform specific or the Baltic, but in general, we talk yeah. about like, true, true. digital banking, but uh, we definitely see that there's some uh, good traction for many of the players, and definitely. Uh, what, what we see, I guess, is that uh, those digital banks which come to basically and build something from scratch, they uh, make the customer service so much better and then the banks have to adapt and that's really definitely what we see. Uh, and then the question is going to be, uh, is it going to be kind of um, innovation, is it going to lead to distribution, so you're going to have your innovators, which are going to lead to having a lot of clients and they can actually serve a lot of clients uh, globally or the specific uh, geography, so it's going to be distribution. We're going to uh, go on, go on, and actually innovate and bring the same customer service to clients. So this is is it going to be your digital banks, which not going to be to reach critical mass of a lot of clients, or it's going to be big banks who are going to innovate and actually build the same what digital banks are offering. And that's a really interesting uh, space to look at. So okay. we ourselves, are, we are perhaps not necessarily directly involved in that, but we definitely follow what's happening. Well, as a, as a startup in 2015, you, you certainly had to feel for it, and uh, you did you did come into struggles in how to basically uh, carve your way in a rather saturated market. But I wouldn't say that we necessarily compete with the bank directly. So basically, what we provide is still what we do is actually we, our vision is really actually to make uh, open up loans as a new asset class. So the people when they think about where to invest in, they can think okay. Stocks, I can invest in bonds, I can invest in crypto, I can invest whatever in deals, take commodities, but I also can invest in loans. And this open up to the digital investors. Does it mean that we are necessarily competing with banks? I wouldn't say so. So to some extent maybe but not not necessarily. So the, the banks really is I guess more about kind of for the corporate versus like retail bank, but that's a different kind of proposition that they offer. And how difficult was it for you, uh, harking back to the points that Andres raised? to collaborate with the banks in both setting up your business, running your business, going into scale-up phase perhaps? Um, I think it's basically, uh, on one hand it would be easy to say it was difficult, but actually just the way how you approach it and our mindset from day one, and that means that we have to be super actually uh, kind of a uh, good partner for any of the banks. So we still going to need the banks, we still going to need the, uh, those institutions where we hold the money and they're going to look at us and they can screen us like super carefully because we deal with a lot of money with a lot of asset transactions. So when it comes to the same AML, not only a client, actually our, uh, our uh, approach and policies are 
the same as a bank. So we have, we have in, in many cases even uh, even better because we can adapt the new technologies which are out there uh, to the banks. So the same if you look at the digital verification, online verification. So actually we were the first to uh, implement it in our service ahead of uh, as you see the bill mentioned that, uh, that they were the first to the banks. We had it like half a year before then, right? Mm -hmm. So basically those things is uh, what uh, uh, I speak is about the mindset which we have had. And because of the right mindset, I think we have had the right fundamentals to be a good partner. And today we uh, have a partnership with like 15 banks or so across uh, many different geographies. And what they look at us, the level of the dollar kind of procedures and policies are up to the standards we should expect. Mm -hmm. So basically, startups are more nimble, startups are quicker to adapt, startups are quicker to learn and implement new technologies, and thus perhaps uh, more ready to implement all the AML KYC uh, uh, compliance issues that are inevitably coming up uh, as of recent years, especially. Now, Norman, I know you have uh, a new fund. I know um, Alton has been uh, contributing towards your new fund, so congratulations on that. And um, my question to you would be, uh, well, given all these positive aspects that startups um, in fintech uh, demonstrate, especially with regards to the subject at hand today, would you say that you'd be more interested in allocating or giving green light to those startups now that you, you, you're facing this, um, this opportunity? is actually based on uh, growth strategy expansion, so growth strategy is um, not about the startups at all. However, uh, however uh, if, this, if the startup uh, grew to the phase that uh, know, it's, uh, they, they have a turnover, it's, uh, you know, the business model works, there are clients who buy products and etc. And, uh, and the, there needs to scale to this business so then we probably are an investor. So actually um, so some such point of view yes so actually uh, we are monitoring the startup community and looking for our uh, next uh, possible deals. And I just want to add uh, to the previous conversation that, uh, that actually and also uh, you know uh, you, you heard what uh, uh, my uh, Mr. said actually, you know, it's uh, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, strict rules. Uh, I also have to follow, uh, but uh, but in a way, actually, uh, as I see it, is uh, that uh, probably uh, if I would invest, I would uh, invest in uh, probably in the case where where banks are not interested. Uh, so actually, there is uh, probably a lot of uh, small deals. Uh, like for, for example, mobility, so actually they, they have a lot of deals, they have a lot, a lot of clients. So actually loyalty of clients are very important in, uh, in, in this business actually. In, uh, it's, it's like every business, it's uh, you know, uh, loyalty of the client and, uh, and actually in the most future forecasts and for fintech companies, you know, it's uh, easy to, you know, to show this uh, hockey. Um, yeah, so actually, it's for for you know for manufacturers and so on. It's uh, very difficult, you know, to to convince uh, you know in exits that, uh, that your your company will grow. For for fintech, it's uh, it's much much easier. From such perspective, it's uh, probably uh, a good investment. And what's your typical ticket size? Just so you know. It's uh, up to four million, almost four million. And how big is the new fund? Uh, it's going to be planned to close uh, the fund at the level of 75 million, and so now 25. 25, okay. Well, um, thanks. Um, now that you have sort of invested in a potential investments further down with a uh, few uh, venture capital funds, could you perhaps comment on during these times, how has your as a state owned? Uh, company, fund, manager, agent, company, investment portfolio changed over time. Have you seen any evolution in perhaps the direction towards fintechs, uh, 
towards more innovative solutions, or are you are you simply looking for uh, growth uh, to cool? Yeah, <coughs> talking about the fintechs, I can explain a lot of uh, those fintechs which are supported by the album directly or indirectly. Indirectly, there are a few like Norman said, the mobility, uh, greenware, uh, then we have all the uh, solutions. There are a couple of them, three or four, which I can name, perhaps uh, four guys from Alton can name some, several more, but not a very uh, big number, right? So, uh, but of course, those fintechs we support through the venture capital, and why it's so, it's just very simple if we have, and I very enjoyed that you also mentioned that we are company, like an agency, what's important for our uh, our management task is then to run the co uh, this institution of like the company, which should be break even, which should earn some also profit each year, uh, not only us from the government. So, and what we are doing, we are like uh, putting uh, our attention to those fields where we can find uh, actually easy and cheap money for ourselves, and we see that it will be good project in overall. There will be really break even, and we will earn something like simple loans and so on, uh, typically for manufacturers for for trading and so on, we issue bonds there, we attract money, we give that money to the sector, we receive back, that's all. And we typical banking. Uh, sorry? Typical banking. Typical banking, right, with the committees and so on. What, when we are talking about venture capital, um, which can then support fintechs and so on, we leave most of the money coming from EU funds, we created fund to fund which was supported by the government, and for example it was more like 100 million euros, we put two thirds of that money, more than two thirds of that money, 70 million euros for venture capital because we saw that this money particularly need to go there. There's a high possibility also, sorry, not to lose that money, but then it's better EU funds money, which is actually created to do that. And we feel quite safe that when we attract money from the, our own, we can do that ourselves, right? So currently it's the fourth generation starting from the accelerator, C, pre C. Also expansion, we see that actually the party for uh, for those types of projects actually has exactly this is a real handwriting when we can do it ourselves. When there is a high possibility of risk, we put EU funds money. That's it. It's just logical sense. German taxpayer. Yeah. Sorry for being very frank. Absolutely, that's what we get for. We're here to engage a very frank, very honest, very interesting and hopefully uh, useful um, fact-based uh, information. Andres, now, um, for you, as a venture capitalist for many, many years, do you see uh, that being still true that 9 out of 10 startups actually fail? Does this statistic ring a bell to you as a small? So, so, uh, so, I was actually on the startup side for many more years than on the venture side. Oh, right. um, so, I've seen startups from the inside and had my own failures and so forth. Um, so I can I can say very openly our fund model for the fund we've just closed is that we will write off forty percent of the investments. Congratulations, um, by the way, before you go into the negatives. <laughs> so you know that's not a negative. That's part of a venture capital model, right? And it's a you know when I talk to people who don't know about venture capital, it seems completely insane, right? But um, successful men, successful venture capital firms around the world, and there's there's a curve, there's a power law curve within firms as well, the successful ones are also writing off a significant number of their investments because you have to invest in high, really ambitious projects that have the potential to generate outside returns where a single company can return the entire fund. Right? And so that's that's our ambition, that's why you use the tagline backing ambitious Baltic families because we need, we need the people who are building really big businesses that could return the entire fund many times over. If they're successful, but taking that kind of a risk, you know, it entails knowing that uh, a whole bunch of those will not work out, right? And so, so that's that's the business model, and and you know, we think it's going to gen generate great returns, um, but it's a it's very different from a private equity business, and I think in in this region because there hasn't been a lot of venture venture capital, those things are often confused. Absolutely. Well, you're preaching to the choir. I'm, I'm all for uh, with you here. But now, uh, a big question is this. Given that the AML and compliance um, issue as such is so global, do you gentlemen see any specific directions where, you know, a few unicorns may be forming? Yeah, I mean, you know, so there's the flip side of every coin, right? So the fact that AML and KYC has become a very big issue 
Uh, I think even over time, Europe will be perhaps pushing America in terms of uh, where, the, where the regulatory uh, line lies. You know, there are opportunities. So in Estonia, one of the fast-growing startups is Verif, which has a KYC product, basically. Uh, is doing very well, so we're raising a ton of money in the valley. And um, you know, there, there are more of those in this region. So we're looking also at startups that are providing solutions for the industry, uh, for the financial services industry to manage this and our KYC process compliance in a more efficient way. Because if they won't be able to do it, then you know, the economy doesn't move, and loans don't happen, transactions don't happen, bank accounts don't get opened, and, and so forth. So, uh, so I think there's opportunity on that side as well, and, and we're definitely seeing a lot of uh, Baltic innovation on that side. Perfect. Well, that's, yes. Uh, the question is uh, where the banks will draw the line. I mean, where the clients they, they want to serve, and, uh, yeah. and what, what not to serve. So basically this is a, you know, a not one million question probably. So actually, where, where are these lines? Uh, mm -hmm. The banks, in my opinion, are still strong. So they are maybe slow, but they they are you know, strong uh, in muscles and uh, they're capable of doing uh, you know great great things. Also, as a former banker, you know, I have to somehow be loyal also to this sort of skill. And uh, and this is this is a question because you know the currently I see that uh, a lot of fintech companies. More profited from, from this situation because suddenly a lot of top suppliers, you know, it was uh, in a very short time, then these, let's say, top suppliers went somewhere. So it's, they, they, sort of, uh, they still need to transfer money uh, to do something. And, uh, and of course, there is an uh, unfair environment, unfair towards banks, actually, because I think the companies are not. Uh, regulated so strongly, so, so this is just a question of the line. Mm -hmm. So the bank regulation being a huge book, where does uh, FinTech uh, none or at least a payment institution type of uh, small or very light regulation allowing uh, perhaps competes directly with the bank transactional business, perhaps more directly, and then at the same time bear perhaps uh, less responsibility on the end of the OEC and compliance? Uh, I think we could be here just on a very good question, we probably could spend a whole conference on that issue uh, of regulated banking sector and the non banking sector. I think that the one important uh, and core principle here is that we all European banks and also public banks were persuading on a, on a global scale is that the uh, same risks are uh, requiring the same regulation. So we don't think that it's fair to compete with a less regulation, and uh, probably also that will touch upon that those uh, customers and always the culprits and, and criminals definitely are looking for uh, less regulated opportunities to uh, to place their funds into the financial system. And so that's the most trickiest issue, probably how just to make it also more durable for. How make fintechs more durable and resistible against the uh, uh, use of them by, by criminals? So uh, that, that that's a really good issue. And um, I, I, I personally am very pleased that in a conference like this we also are discussing about uh, uh, financial crime and how to tackle financial crime. And I I hope that it will become some sort of tradition that we will at least you have panels how we better tackle financial crime and how we incorporate all together. Uh, to, to prevent financial crime, and that will help for all of us to draw the line. Uh, or perhaps call for the regulator to change some uh, regulations with regards to banking. And definitely, it's a question also how you will just regain the trust on uh, your side and also on the side of your customers. So it's very important that, uh, that uh, 